let's walk through because obviously we documented the Dakota way pretty extensively. So, and we always think of the four core pillars are, uh, you know, set expectations. And I think you're really the one that when I was sort of just talking about just internally documenting this, you're the one that sort of hit on set expectations first. Now, I think being in the third party business that we didn't, we always wanted to be the dog, not the tail. And so you talk about setting expectations that really, I mean, that, that, that to me, and you actually said it, but it's like, if you're not setting expectations up front with a sales plan and agreeing, you want to just talk about that a little bit? Cause that's really where it all starts, right? Yeah. And really before setting expectations, it starts with the strategy, right? And, and being able to set those expectations behind data, behind um, your asset class, where you stand in terms of your evolution as a firm, what's our product structure? Um, so who are actually going to be able to buy this strategy based on the vehicle we have? Um, so there's a big process even before setting expectations of where am I going to be taking the strategy to market? Who are the natural buyers of this strategy, not just as an asset class, but based on where we are as a firm, AUM, track record, um, and so once you have a, a firm strategy and process, it can be different for every type of fund, whether you're an ETF or you're a hedge fund or private equity fund seven, um, your strategy is going to look a little, little bit different. So you have to own and create your own strategy. And then- And you mean sales strategy. Sales strategy, yeah. correct. And that's what's going to help you come to a portfolio manager or a CEO at an investment firm and set expectations because you've already done the work to understand where the natural buyers are of your strategy. And that's a big part before you get into the execution of the sales plan. You don't want to live in a world of assumptions, right? If you allow for the portfolio manager, that CEO to make their own assumptions about what a successful fundraise is going to look like, you know that you're going to be mismatched, right? Just because they're going to have obviously very uh, lofty, very high uh, expectations for what a successful fundraise is going to look like. But if it's not grounded in reality, the reality that you're talking about doing that asset class study to really understand like what's the precedent that's set in that asset class against those channels that you're taking the strategy, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Yeah. And you really can't blame a PM, right? You can't blame a PM for having expectations yeah. fundraising up here. The reason being is it's that the reason PMs have such high expectations is because there's such a high they believe belief themselves. in their ability to deliver, right? So, but normally their expectations are up here. What's feasible in terms of fundraise and reality is kind of down here, right? And it's bridging that gap. And to that point, it's about focusing on what you need to do to reach those expectations in terms of, uh, we talk about KPIs, right? You know, activity and meetings, how many meetings does it take to get to a sale? You know, a lot of PMs think they can come in and uh, well, what we say internally is you can't win the business in the first meeting, but you can lose the business in the first meeting. So instituting that sort of philosophy that this, this is going to be a process from the beginning, uh, but we're going to be focused on the best areas of opportunity. We're just going to have you go through that process with us and ultimately lead to those expectations. And by the way, that's all that we can control. Yeah. Is who are we calling on the levels of activities? What are we saying in that meeting? And are, and are we following up? Like that's what we can control, right? So setting the expectation up front that we're going to cover a certain amount of ground and it's going to take time. We can always influence or affect the, the timing of a decision on what we can control to that point. We can control our outreach and our activity and who we're calling on the defined universe. We cannot control the, the fundraising, the actual allocation of capital, right? But we can control how often we're in front of folks and the the continuation of that sales process. And we know that by executing that process, yeah, the fundraising, well, that's when success comes. And that's why when whether it's with our partners on the third party side or even internally at investment fund, we don't put fundraising targets, right? We, we actually say we will cover a certain market for your strategy and we will have full market coverage by this day and time. That's what we can control. What are the facts behind what we've laid out and what we're accomplishing? So depending on the manager and the cadence that we get into, we're reporting on how many meetings have we set up in the last two weeks? How many meetings have we completed in the last two weeks? And it's not, hey, we had 10 meetings that were all good meetings. It's, this is what was covered in the meeting. They're a qualified buyer. And is there an actionable next step? Right. And that's all the PMs really care about is what's the next step. Um, and as Dan alluded to, you're not always going to get the clear 
hey, we're allocating next quarter to this asset class, but at least you know where you stand against that. Uh, and then the other key piece to the reporting side of it would be any feedback that we're getting from who we're talking to on the asset class, potentially the structure. And then as a team, and this is a process that we kind of created, I think, from the reporting side was creating those FAQs of, hey, here's feedback that we're getting consistently. Let's build out a questionnaire around what is coming up in the beginning of meetings so that we can hit those head on to start those meetings so they're not coming up in three, six months as we're trying to close this business. Yeah, so think, so one thing I don't think always comes across as we'll try to really, really like keep using the word codify is that the, the importance of setting expectations is you have the, is, is getting the PMs, okay, or whomever our bosses that we're raising money for to buy into how we see the world in terms of execution, right? And getting a, uh, agreement and alignment. That's the whole concept of setting expectations, right? And I guess it really doesn't matter if you're a W-2 employee and you work for a firm, doesn't matter what it is, you have a boss, right? And you have to manage those expectations. It's getting them to buy into our view of the world and how we do things versus if they, but if you don't do that, then you're going to leave, like you just said, assumptions, a little mismatch. Yeah. Right. And so the critical component of this is, well, is documenting the sales plan, doing the work that you just said ahead of time, right? Doing the asset class studies, understanding where you're going to take it, documenting that, then sitting down with them and saying, hey, look, here's the sales plan. And then having them agree to what good looks like. You've got to do, you haven't defined what good looks like. Yeah. Because absent of that, again, the PM or the CEO's definition of good could be very different of yours. And you're just, again, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. I look at it this way. If you don't set expectations and you don't do this properly, you're actually doing a disservice to your boss or, in our case, our clients. Right? Because if, it, if the relationship doesn't work out, everyone's just wasted 6, 12, 18 months of, yeah. of time. Right? You're just better off. And in fact, you know, if I were CEO or head of sales or head of distribution, whatever that might be, I would demand a sales plan. Right? Very clear sales plan. Right? Because it's... It cuts both ways. And then you started getting to that with Ryan and talking about reporting. I mean, that is critical. Right. And being able to deliver back the feedback, here's where I stand against that that sales plan. Because we always talk about absent of that communication, what's the automatic assumption of a CEO or a portfolio manager or not, or right. that you're not doing anything. Right. Exactly. So you have to report back. And since most, you want to we talk about uh, a lot of salespeople want to hide, right? It's a national inclination. If any salesperson in any industry wants to hide. I remember... When, you know, Paul O'Grady took over as head of distribution for the first time, he brought the entire portfolio manager team and the CEO basically under the hood and just told them exactly what was going on in a very clear way. And it ended eventually, it took like three months, it ended all of the odds of that. Yeah, yeah, I believe. Right? Because it ended all that. Because now all of a sudden they're, they're bought into the plan. They agreed to the plan. You're executing the plan. And then you have low vol, right? The goal is to have low vol. Talk about just the consistency of how important the consistency of the reporting, because I would say that before we can get into the execution, having the reporting plan in place, the cadence is really, really critical because then they can't, what's the last thing you want to do is be on vacation, be playing golf, whatever you get a call. <laughs> Where are you? I've been never visiting anybody. <laughs> what it's gonna be? Yeah. I think the, the cadence is mm -hmm. crucial, right? Because the managing up component that we talked about, right? Whether it's every week or every other week, here's exactly who we're calling on. Here's the activity we set up. Here's where we need you, uh, Mr. Mr. PM, on the road, right? But then also, right, the feedback that we're getting, that results in the pipeline, right? And over time, that pipeline will grow. But I think most importantly is it's not just activity for activity's sake. To Steve's point is we're calling on qualified buyers that can actually allocate to our strategy and not just setting up meetings just to fluff up our numbers, right? right? That gets sniffed out very, very quick, right? So that the reporting not only... It enforces, right, the managing up, but you also don't want to shoot a zero week after week from an activity standpoint. And you want to make money, right? You want to make money. And if, if you're reporting to your boss, your CEO, the PMs, or whoever, right, and you keep going a few weeks with zero, it's, that's uncomfortable, right? So it actually forces that, that outreach and that activity. And so just to kind of recap, so as we have in the Dakota way, we talk about setting expectations all about creating a sales plan getting buy-in uh, from the CEO or your boss to that plan, and then what success looks like, what good looks like, right? Where it's it's really progress, account coverage, giving feedback, and the most important thing is the final is making sure you have a consistent 
plan to report, whether it's once a week or once every two weeks, I'd say no, nothing less than that. Yep. Yep. Right. And then you're off. Then you're, then you end up being the dog and not the tail is really the goal at the end of the day. And you're, and you, like you said, Dan, you have total control over that. Yeah. I think you started, you touched on something that's really important. I think we should uh, discuss as well. And we're not, we're not creating this just for the sake of creating busy work. Right. right well, this is, this is not about, uh, uh, taking people away from productive activity and being out and forming relationships and conducting the meetings and, and making those calls. Uh, this is creating the infrastructure and the system for people to be successful, to create lines of revenue, not only for the business, but for ourselves, right? It's how you build careers is by having that level of uh, being so detail oriented to be able to track what those opportunities are, knowing where to follow up, knowing who to call on. That's how you, you build a career and the investment sales. <laughs>